Hello and welcome to a very special Halloween edition of Curtain Call. This time we're featuring the Rogue Swan Theatre Company's production of Rogue Swan Enters the Silver Screen here at the Milburn Stone Theatre. We've got three great interviews lined up and I don't want to waste any more time, so curtain up. So, first up, I have Katie Gordon here. Katie, welcome to Curtain Call. Thank you so much, Andrew. Sure thing. So, uh, this is not your first time on the Milburn Stone Theater stage, is no, it? No, no, no. I've been here for years. Um, I did I Do, I Do, actually, mm -hmm. with one of our cast members, Dane Hutchinson, about 15 years ago here. Um, we've done Silver Scream here. I've done Rocky Horror with you here. Mm -hmm. And um, most recently, you and I collaborated on Chicago. Yep, that was... Uh, a little bit before everything shut down. Right before things shut. We did Chicago and everything shut down. Oh, uh, there was no. Uh, there was no. There was no, no coming on, back. No on encore back. for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, talk to me about the Rogue Swan Theater Company. So, Rogue Swan is a uh, theater company that specializes in modernizing vaudeville. Um, we're slightly different than community theater because we do not have uh, normal auditions. We have a core company of players, and those players include um, our musicians, they include our actors, our dancers, and they travel from show to show with us so that as we do vaudevilles, we can keep building on initial characters. Can you tell us a couple of the other former Rogue Swan shows that you've put together, your vaudevilles, et cetera? So we have done three different vaudevilles that build on each other. Um, Genesis, it goes into Last Call, and then the next chapter. Hmm. And each one builds on different characters. For example, we have a tattooed man that every time we come into the theater, uh, every time we start a vaudeville, we're actually physically walking into an old time town as an old time vaudeville theater. So we have a belly dancer, we have a tattooed man, we have a, uh, a knife thrower. So we have all of these different characters and each vaudeville travels with these same characters so that the audience has the ability to connect to them. Excellent. So switching to Rogue Swan enters the Silver Scream. <clears throat> this is not the first time that Silver Scream has been presented. Can you give us a little bit of history on Silver Scream? So Silver Scream is a show that my brother wrote and our friend James Taylor, not the James Taylor, <laughs> but our James Taylor, um, did the composition, music composition for, and I'm the original choreographer. Um, we started doing it back around the mid 90s, around 96. Um, it's been done so, several times. It's been done to the point that the person who is the director that you're going to talk to, Lily, was actually a toddler when we first started doing it. My children, Jess and Josh, are the voices of the babies that you heard in some of the recordings during Silver Scream. And now Jess is 24 and one of the leads in the show. And Josh is 22 and he's our bassist. So we have done this show our entire family's worth, I guess. Excellent. My kids have grown up with this show. Yeah, it's definitely a generational show as it Absolutely. keeps on growing. Absolutely. All right, one last question for you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Why should audiences see Silver Screen? Audiences should come see Silver Screen because where else are you going to ever experience a musical haunted house with your entire cast and, and set in glorious black and white? You're just not going to see that these days. It's not going to happen. Musical Haunted House, come to Silver Scream. There we go. Thank you very much, Katie. Thanks, Andrew. Right now, I'm here with Jimmy. Jimmy, hello. Welcome to Hi. Curtain Call. Thank you for having me. Sure thing. So uh, tell us a little bit about your history with Silver Scream. Uh, Silver Scream is a love letter to the horror movies that I grew up with. Um, in 1994, I started writing Silver Scream with my partner, James Taylor. Um, Lily, my daughter, who's the director of this, was in a playpen as we wrote this thing. In 1995 in Mississippi, we did our first production of it, and then 
96 and 97 and then I moved up here after we did it a couple of times there. But we had done a bunch of things. We did uh, a kid's version of a uh, jungle book called The Jungle. We did a kid's version of, uh, or not a kid's version, a, a kid's musical called The Milky Way Mars and Other Candy Bars, <laughs> which is just a kind of a space journey. Um, and then we did Silver Scream and Silver Scream the first year was very much a kid's show. Um, as it aged, I wanted to get more edgy with it, which I think was wrong. Mm. Uh, I think I did it a disservice, and, and so I've pulled it way, way back. It is certainly not a G movie, but it's PG, or not a play, but it's PG. Uh, at some point when we were doing it down in Baltimore, we had made it very, just lots of blood and gore. And, but uh, after I started making my little Chainsaw Sally movie and the Good Sisters movie and all that kind of stuff, I kind of got that out of me. And it's like, this is, this is supposed to be a celebration of these movies and Halloween. Uh, lyrics all through this thing talk about Halloween. And so I, I, I just pulled it back to something for families to experience together. There is a little bit of language, but nothing that you wouldn't hear. I mean, it's tamer than South Park. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that, that is, I've been in love with horror movies um, since, I guess, first grade. Speaking of your love of horror films, and certainly you mentioned Chainsaw Sally, you're an accomplished film director yourself. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about the films you've also made? So, uh, Chainsaw Sally, um, well, we made, just kind of on a whim, uh, a movie of Silver Screen. Uh, and we made it with student stuff, and I had never made a movie, I never wanted to make a movie. Uh, I like seeing movies, but I always thought before the digital age hit, that movies were beyond my, you know, we grew up in a trailer in Mississippi, so making a movie was just not on my radar. Um, so I got a chance to make the Silver Scream movie, and it was pretty well received, even though it was very much a homemade movie. Uh, a producer in Baltimore said, what about this Chainsaw Sally character, which we had developed to promote Scream? Hmm. Chainsaw Sally was our Elvira. And she surpassed Silver Scream significantly because she looked like Chainsaw Sally. And um, we asked Herschel Gordon Lewis, who had kind of become in contact with us, who is the godfather of gore. Herschel Gordon Lewis did Blood Feast, uh, 2000 Maniacs, all the really, the beginning of the gore movies in the 60s. And he, he agreed to do a part in it. And I was the first person to ever direct Herschel Gordon Lewis, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, then we accidentally met Gunnar Hansen, who was Leatherface in the original Texas Chainsaw. And uh, because he had become a Chainsaw Sally fan. <laughs> and so we asked him to play Chainsaw Sally's dad in the movie, and so he did. So we had a little bit of, you know, just a, we had a very little bit of money and a little bit of cachet and everything. And, and it did well for an independent movie. Um, it came out, I guess, 2005 or so. And it did its thing, and it made some money, and it, and, but it went the way of all independent movies, which is, okay, now it's just streaming something. And it is streaming. You can see all my movies like on Tubi and Amazon and all that stuff. Um, but that was it. Uh, we're gonna do one more Chainsaw Sally show. Uh, we decided after we did the couple of movies, and uh, I didn't follow up on the movie thing because I, I didn't wanna move. I had kids here. I didn't wanna torture, put, I didn't wanna put, uh, Jazz and Lily through me going to the West Coast and trying to do this thing that I didn't really know if I wanted to do. And I just, Haberty Grace is safe and it's, it's happy and it was a good school and it's like, I would be a bastard to do that. So we just made our own little TV show on the internet. Um, two seasons of the Chainsaw Sally show. And what was weird is we did it it, I'm not making claim to any pioneering. Before Netflix or anybody was streaming full shows on TV, we did that. We had it on our own server and it crashed our server <laughs> many a time, but thousands of people watched this thing on, online. And so I put up one, two, three, and then when the fourth one came, I would bump off the first one. So by the time word of mouth got around and we got to the end of the season, the only way to see it from the beginning was to buy the DVD. Mm, and it worked and it helped us pay some rent. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we did that, and we're, we were right before uh, COVID hit, we were about to do one more season just because we're aging out of, you know, running around with chainsaws. <laughs> and um, COVID. So it got put off, and hopefully we're going to do it in spring. Just, I don't know. I don't know how many times we're going to do Sally, but hopefully at least one more. So you're also a very accomplished artist. Um, I know that you've done work throughout Harvard Grace and other yep. areas. Can you expand a little bit about some of your favorite art that you've created? Whether it's just clearly there's film, there's also working on things like the set for Silver Screen, but mm -hmm. there's also just a little bit about your art. Uh, in the prehistoric days of VHS video stores, um, I got a job as a video clerk and they were building a new store uh, in what is now um, Constant Friendship. And the owner said, hey, do you want to paint some murals in here? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so I painted the entire store of murals. Warner Brothers guy came in and I started working for Warner Brothers from here because at that time, the main office of East Coast Warner Home Video was right over the line in Virginia which is why he was here at all. Um, and so I did Bugs Bunny's 50th birthday. I did uh, Beetlejuice, the Michael Keaton Batman, um, Gremlins 2, uh, just, just Joe versus Volcano, just all the, ironically we made a, an eight foot, vol, fake eight foot volcano and they shipped it Haw to Hawaii. And I'm going, well, Hawaii for a volcano? Aren't you, I'm almost sure if they have windows, you, you're good. <laughs> but um, so that got me going into this weird thing and uh, then I wound up making sets for Harford Community College and other places here and there um, and somehow I wound up being a medical illustrator at Johns Hopkins for 18 years all because I lied about my resume and um, that went well for a long time and then I stopped doing that and now I work for the city of Haverty Grace as they're, they became an A&E district and uh, the mayor, you know, always had me doing little side jobs and said, dude, I'm old, I need, I need insurance. And so they made me a job. Excellent. So one last question. Yep. We're gonna go back to uh, Rogue Swan enters the silver screen. Okay. Why should audiences come out to see this show? If you love Halloween and if you love horror, and particularly the old classic stuff, the universal stuff, or uh, Ed Wood. This is your show. This is not the show for the people who are looking for the Wells Fargo wagon. This is the show for the people who will dress in black. Excellent. Hey, thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you. The black shining coffin delivers your hope. We Finally, I'm here with Lily. Lily is the one who adapted and directed this production of Silver Screen. So Lily, tell us a little bit about the adaptation process. Sure, so I have grown up with this script. Um, Dad wrote this script when I was a baby. And so I have seen several different iterations of it. Every time he's done it, he's changed it a little bit. There are several songs that started in the show that are no longer in the show. There are new songs that were added later on. Um, and so I knew that every time he performed the show, there was always going to be something different. And so when Katie and I decided now was the moment to do Silver Scream, we sort of talked about it and said, what, how are we going to make it ours? And we decided, well, we have this established troupe of actors that we have been with for years now, and we've created stories around them. So what would happen? if they were the ones that went into the silver screen versus these random people that we didn't know beforehand. And that was the starting point. Uh, my goal was to take, and I took the 2012 silver screen script that we did at Harvard Community College, and I took that as my base. And I tried to be as respectful to the source material that my father wrote as possible and tweaked and changed things that were specific to what would affect our people. So a lot of the writing is still dad. 
and then some of it's mind thrown in or I've changed who says it, those sorts of things. So it was really a careful balancing act between wanting to make sure it made sense for us, but also respecting that my father wrote this and it's been going on for 28 years, sorry dad, 28 years at this point pretty much. So that's how I went about it, very, very carefully. Sure, so literally when you say Rogue Swan enters the silver screen, it's the Rogue Swan theater troupe entering what is the silver screen, I imagine, right? Exactly, so the silver screen is this black and white horror realm. Uh, so we go all the way from the absolute classics that I watched with my dad in bed on sick days to all the way up, we stop at 80 slasher horror. So that's the amount of time we're covering. We didn't want to go too far into it because then it gets too, too much of a show. So the biggest change was instead of all of the monsters being random people or just being the monsters, our people were pulled in, they were put under this curse and are trapped in these bodies repeating over and over and over again. And our three leads get sucked in last. So they're like, where is everyone? They find them and like, oh crap, we're gonna have to start doing this too if we don't figure out how to get everyone out. So that is the premise of this version of the show. It's very personal because instead of it being, oh my gosh, this random person's trying to eat me, Jesse, one of our leads, it's his mom that's trying to fight him. So it becomes a much more personal show. It makes the stakes, in my opinion, so much higher and I think adds a level of emotion that the audience will feel. If the audience has that moment of what happens if it was my family that was pulled in, then I've done my job. It, that's at least in my opinion, because I want people to get that very familial feel from this show, because it is a family. If you've performed with people for, oh my gosh, some of these people I have known since I was a toddler. Hmm. Some of them are my parents, so I've known them my whole life. And to get those connections in there gives it meaning to me. And that was what I wanted to bring to the table. Excellent. So speaking about growing up and living in a house, maybe a little bit full of horror at times. Full all the of horror. In all the best ways. Not in all like, the best ways. Can you give us one story at least of Lily growing up in this house that this you experienced as a kid. Yeah, so one of my biggest things is I, you know, you don't know your family's weird until you take it into the context of going into someone else's house. So to me, it was normal that we had horror movie posters, all of the action figures. It was normal that when I was sick in elementary school, dad would stay home with me and we would sit there and watch the classic horror movies, the old Dracula. Um, and then I would have a friend over and it was like the house was a museum. They couldn't stop looking at everything. They had all of these questions. I'm like, what, you don't have a chainsaw hanging, <laughs> hanging up? That's weird. We had, um, from one of our old productions of Silver Screen, we had a Kong hand that was made into a chair and that's what Shelly was trapped in. We had that chair in our house and everyone wanted to sit in this chair because it's a, a working, a pan that opened and shut and they were fascinated by this and it was so odd to me at first that this was not the norm and then I was like oh my friends have like little figurines and stuff I got it okay this looks very different than my house this is a new experience I go with dad and watch him shoot films and I do the clapper for him I hold a boom mic for him I get blood on my pants and then teachers are like hey you've got red stuff all over you, are you okay? It's like, yes, I am great. But it was always the best memories. I had a really cool childhood. It's very different, but I mean, I think I kind of lucked out. Excellent. Yeah. So one last question for you. Sure. Why should audiences come see Silver Screen? Oh, there's so many reasons. First of all, Halloween has become a huge holiday from when I was a kid to an adult. It has hit and people are celebrating now more than ever. And I think that coming to see a new show, even though, okay, so you haven't heard of this before necessarily. Fine, I understand that. It's weird coming to see something new, but that's why you go to a haunted house. You, if you expect what you're going to see, it's not as scary. Come to Silver Scream because it's not what you're expecting. You don't know what you're gonna get out of. You're gonna have thrills and chills and there's a lot of comedy built in. It's funny. 
My dad is really funny. He makes ridiculous faces as an old count. It's amazing. But we also have one of the most talented bands that I, I mean, I take so much pride in our band. And our band made this music come together from tracks that they had to sit there and layer by layer break apart to make it fully live for the first time. And it's beautiful. The dances are phenomenal and our people together are something truly unique in my mind. So I'd say take a chance like you would a haunted house or a new movie or anything else. You are going to have an amazing time. Excellent. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. I am Thank you, Katie, Jimmy, and Lily. The Rogue Swan enters the Silver Screen runs here at the Milburn Stone Theater, October 28th, 29th, November 4th, and 5th. Show times are at 8 o'clock, and tickets start at $22. Please go to milburnstone.com to get your tickets today. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>